So, good morning everyone, and thank you for coming to the session on the economic costs of dementia. I hope that's the session that you are all here for. If it's not, you're in the wrong room. Um, so, I'm really delighted to be able to uh, introduce this session. I think the economic costs is an issue and of, you know, one which is of great interest to associations, to policymakers. It really is one that when people are talking about dementia and talking about policy making, that is the question that always comes up is, and so what is the cost? So I'm really delighted to be able to have um, these five presenters today um, presenting on different aspects. Um, there will be time for questions at the end, hopefully. The speakers know they have to keep to time. And when we have questions at the end, just a, a reminder to the audience that this is a hybrid session. So we do have people joining us online, so welcome. Um, so if you do get the microphone to ask a question, please speak into it because it's not just the people in the room who need to be able to hear you, it's people online as well. So, without any further ado, I would like to invite Laura Philbin up, who's going to talk about the economic costs of caring in Ireland, the impact of the cost of living crisis on family carers, and taking action to address it. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, so, I am Laura. I'm the Research and Policy Manager at the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. So, in Ireland, there are over 180,000 informal carers of people living with dementia, so caring for a family member or for a friend. And the value of this to the state is estimated to be in the region of 804 million euro per year. And I think what we need to remember is that caring in Ireland has long been associated with poor health outcomes like stress, burnout, loneliness, isolation. And that's even when we were at our most affluent during the Celtic Tiger. And to put this into context, the prevalence of clinical depression among family carers of people with dementia in Ireland is three times the national average. So since the end of 2021, Ireland has been experiencing a serious cost of living crisis like many countries across the world. And this escalating cost of living crisis is now exposing a vulnerable cohort to even more stress and de-stress um, due to the cost of care, this is rising, and due to a reduced ability to work. So social protection research-related advocacy um, is actually very new to the Alzheimer's Society. I am very much not a health economist, so <laughs> I don't even know what the word econometrics and things like that mean, but we really saw in our grassroots that people were struggling with the financial costs of caring, and we felt that we just have to take some action now to, to address this. So what I'm presenting today is actually our first kind of move into to this area in Ireland. We're very lucky as well. We're fortunate that we have other organizations and strong relationships with people who are very well versed in this area, such as Family Carers Ireland and St. Vincent de Paul. So how did we get started? Family Carers Ireland is a charity that represents over 500,000 family carers in Ireland, and this is you know, children, people with a range of illnesses and conditions, and they were doing some research in 2022, and as part of this, they collected financial information from family carers, and we worked with them to extract the data that was related specifically to people living with dementia, just to kind of get a first look into to what's going on for people who are caring for someone with dementia, and we produced this report on it. So the results were stark. Um, we had 129 people. The majority were caring for parents, and around one in five were caring for a spouse. So 55% said they're having difficulty making ends meet. And actually, this is maybe kind of an Irish thing. So basically, 55% of people were struggling to you know, meet, their, meet their expenses. 12% um, were actually having great difficulty making ends meet. 18% said they're cutting back on household essentials like food, electricity, you know, keeping the, the heating off. And 23% have cut back on seeing friends and family. And this is really important because I think we all know that seeing friends and family, doing your hobbies, they're the very things that can keep us well, particularly when we're in a stressful situation. And actually what we found was the majority of respondents, so around 77% of people actually felt that their value their value as, as a carer or their role was not recognised by society. And if we go back for a minute, 804 million euro per annum is, is their value to society, but they feel like they're not recognised. So there's a big issue there. And in some cases, their financial difficulties were so stressful that they were falling behind on their mortgage repayments. They're not able to keep up with their energy bills. And we made recommendations from this report, and I won't go into detail because they're very specific to the, the Irish social protection system, but essentially what we asked for was increased and sustainable financial supports for family carers, 
um, help with rising energy costs, that's our biggest challenge, and also to recognise the cost of caring, so things like sanitary wear, fuel, diesel, when making decisions about financial support. But basically, after writing this report, we knew that we needed to go deeper and look more into what is impacting family carers, and also not just the financial pressure, but how, how are they feeling about it. So this brings us to the experience of dementia in Ireland, a snapshot in time. So this was a national piece of research that we conducted, and it was across a range of areas, so service access, health, communities, um, looking at kind of all of our previous work. And what we really wanted to do as part of this was also to learn about the financial cost of caring. So we collected the data in May and June 2023, so just a few months ago, and we had 597 family carers take part in this research and 72 people living with dementia. So 308 people said that they were involved in, in the financial aspects of, of a person living with dementia's life. So 50%, very similar to the previous study, 50% reporting difficulty making ends meet. 11% again, great difficulty making ends meet. And then 36% of carers actually needed to make work adjustments. So, so they either stopped work, they had to reduce their working hours, they had to change their hours, and almost one in three spend more than 80% of their time caring, and this is around 134 hours per week. So when you think about the amount of time someone has spent caring, how are they able to, how are they able to work as well? We'll get there. So what we found then, you know, statistics are great, and actually something I've learned from working in the Alzheimer's Society is the media love a good statistic. If you want your work in the media, lots of statistics. But we're really interested in, in the humans as well behind the story. So carers describe difficulties with, as I said, keeping up with their mortgage repayments, bills, buying food. Many were relying on loans from family members. They're eroding their savings. And a lot of them report consistent worry and guilt about their own future, but also Many of them have young families because they're caring for a parent and they were worried about their children's future. They felt like they were spending money that should be for their children on the person living with dementia. And just to say that this, this issue is, is not, people living with dementia are not causing this problem for family carers, it's, it's the lack of financial supports provided by our social protection system. And the rising cost of living actually goes really hand in hand with the rising cost of providing care and support to someone with dementia. And these effects are being felt deeply by family carers. So you'll just see a, a selection of quotes there. But one that really stood out to me was a person said that she couldn't continue to visit her father who has dementia quite as often because of the cost of diesel. So that person living with dementia is not getting the support that they need. And the family carer is feeling guilty because they can't go and see them. But it's, it's literally down to an economic cost. Then financial challenges, what we really found is they're intensifying the stress and the burnout and the worry and the health challenges that people are already experiencing. As we said, many are reporting on cutting back on socialising hobbies and what they deem to be these non-essentials. But as I said, they're the things that keep us well. They're the things that keep us going in, in hard times, as, as we've all learned, I think, during COVID-19. So both of these research studies clearly show that year on year, carers continue to experience financial hardship, intensified stress, worry, and anxiety on top of their caring role. So one of the great privileges of working in the Alzheimer's Society in, in research is that you actually get to kind of see it turn into action because we have an advocacy team and a communications team and that, that's one of the really, really positive things. So, uh, we're very invested in evidence-based advocacy in the, the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. My colleague, Clodagh Whelan, is our advocacy manager. So in Ireland, we do our budget once a year. I think that's kind of an unusual thing, but it's, it's a whole thing in, in October. So every year, ourselves and, and all of the other charities create a campaign where we ask the government to invest in dementia services and supports for people living with dementia. So for the first time here, you'll see social protection actually appeared in our pre-budget submission. Then we managed to get this news of the financial hardship of family carers into three separate news cycles. So we had our first report, we had the launch of our pre-budget submission, and we had the launch of our experience of dementia in Ireland report. So news, radio, um, really getting it out into the public domain that this is something that, that we need to think about, and also working with other charities and collaborators. Um, for example, and you know, this, this political advocacy is really important. For example, all of these reports were in the inbox of every politician in Ireland. So 
they knew what, exactly what was happening. Uh, we briefed political representatives, we have information on our website, press releases, and we actually had our budget there last week or, or the week before. And I was nearly kind of worried about that, that this part of the presentation because what we asked for was an increase of €27.50 Euro for the, the carer's benefit or carer's allowance, and now they only increased it by €12. Euro. So this still represents actually a real-time cut when you think about inflation and, and, and the cost of caring. And I was thinking, oh, is it going to look like, you know, th these efforts failed? But actually, they haven't failed because we've actually stepped into this space now. We've put the, the advocacy, we've put this kind of research and we've put this financial hardship of family carers onto public record. And now we look forward to continuing our, our advocacy work in that. So this, I just have the, the pleasure of, of presenting this work today, but it's, it's actually really thanks to Ms. Clodagh Whelan, Dr. Diana O'Doherty, uh, Kira O'Reilly, Dr. Nikki Dunn, and our fabulous PPI contributors, Ms. Janice Nolan Palmer, John Crowley, Ms. Alison McCarthy, and also to St. Vincent de Paul. So the reports are available on our website. And if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Laura, for that really interesting presentation. I think um, the ability to have the, as you say, everyone loves a good start. It makes a really easy way to communicate um, the issues facing carers. And I think to have the balance of the statistics, but also the personal experiences that you shared as well, um, is really impactful. Um, does anyone have any questions in the room? Would anyone like to ask Laura anything about the reports or about their campaign, their work? Um, I should have actually taken the iPad as well for the online questions. So I don't see any questions in the room. Um, in that case, I would just ask you to say thank you to Laura again, but a round of applause for the excellent presentation. Thank you so much. And I'll move on to our next speaker, who is Soren Matke from the US, who's going to talk about uh, closing the gap, the estimated investment needed to increase England's capacity to deliver an Alzheimer's treatment uh, to G7 average levels and implications for wait times. So the floor is yours. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Still slightly jet lagged coming here from Southern California, so <laughs> forgive me <laughs> for being a little hoarse. Um, I'm talking today about closing the gap. Like, how much would NHS England to have to invest to get at least to the G G7 average spending levels? And that is an interesting question because England has long been at the forefront of sort of political leadership when it came to Alzheimer's disease with sort of ambitions like becoming the most dementia-friendly country on earth by um, 2025 or whenever that was. But that tended to contrast with a NHS that's actually creaking at the seams, right? Years of underinvestment, late bear by COVID. So we wanted to look like how close is England with these great ambitions actually to even be sort of average among the G7 countries. So here are my disclosures. So um, the background to the story is that the arrival of disease modifying treatments, of course, creates a substantial challenge for health systems. We have an enormously prevalent disease that has mostly not been diagnosed at all because there was limited therapeutic consequence from diagnosing it. And we have this very, very large prevalent patient pool. So as the first disease-modifying treatments now become available, there's this enormous backlog of people that have never been formally diagnosed and then hitting um, a pretty much unprepared healthcare system because this ecosystem hasn't had time to evolve. The problem is particularly hard for countries that have comparatively low capacity to begin with. And so we wanted to know how does this look for NHS England. Uh, 
This was a combination of desk research, so we got a lot of data on how many um, specialists like geriatric psychiatrists, neurologists, geriatricians are in NHS England, what are their working hours, what, how many visits do they do, to estimate like how many people could they actually see if these treatments become available. Things like PET scanners, MRI scanners, facilities for lumbar puncture and so on. And then we have um, cost data that like how much does this actually cost to I increase capacity. And then we use a Markov, a simulation model to estimate um, A, how long people will have to wait at status quo and then how long would people have to wait if you increase investment and get to G7 average. So this is the baseline and this looks pretty dire. So we have the G7 countries here up and then the England values down and below. And you can see um, the NHS has about 40% of the average capacity of the G7 countries when it comes to things like dementia specialists, uh, PET scanners, has about a fifth of the MRI scanners of other G7 countries, like 20%. That's clearly um, disturbing. And the reason for this is this little number here, 0.4%. That is the percentage of GDP that, uh, in this case, the UK spends on capital investment um, in healthcare. Right? So it's not, it, the NHS or the UK spends a relatively large proportion now of GDP on healthcare, but the money doesn't go into infrastructure. The money goes into mostly salaries. And that was quite surprising to see because in the Blair years, um, the government raised spending from what was well below um, G7 levels to pretty much approaching G7 levels, but it didn't factor into investment. So you can see it's 0.4, G7 average is um, about 0.7, so it's about half of what other countries spend. This change doesn't really factor through in a year or so because you can always push back investment, run this ancient MRI scanner one year longer, postpone renovation of a hospital facility. But if you keep doing that for a decade or two, it really shows. And that's, that's basically behind these numbers. And that factors through in wait times. So this is the projection over 20 years, uh, wait times in months on the y-axis. And you can tell um, how long people would have to wait to go through the diagnostic process for a disease-modifying Alzheimer's treatment. And these are really disturbing numbers. Like we are getting up to 10 years, mostly because people wait for their specialist appointment. The short wait, this is the yellow little thingy above that, the short wait for biomarker testing, keep in mind, is not because there's an abundance of PET scanners and um, lumbar puncture facilities, it's basically because people are held up, they're not just not getting their first appointment would, that would generate the referrals for such tests. So once you actually shrink the wait times for, um, for dementia specialist visits, the yellow bars will increase. So here's what it will take to get at least two G7 average. Um, the headline number is 13.8% billion pounds over 10 years on average, so spread out, fully inflated and whatnot. And the biggest chunks is actually not in fixed costs, so increasing number of PET scanners and MRI scanners, that's sort of yeah, about four billion, so it's about a third, but a, a lot would have to go into the variable costs, like additional specialists, additional nurses to the lumbar punctures, and that would increase capacity to do these tests quite a bit, as you can see. And it would also factor through. So this is, if you remember the picture from a few slides ago, here we talk about 10 years. And here we we'll talk about pretty tolerable wait times, right? You start with the initial influx at about 30 months, <clears throat> but it then comes down pretty quickly to sort of reasonable times in um, people having to wait. And as I explained earlier, this also means that um, people will have to wait longer for their biomarker test, but mostly because they are getting seen faster by, by a specialist. So 
Of course, there are limitations. This is simulation, this is not real numbers, and we combine a lot of published data, but we also use a lot of expert information because some things you just don't know, right? Like what proportion of neurologists are actually able to um, provide a diagnostic evaluation for early stage Alzheimer's care. Um, there are some things that we just couldn't count, right? We did know from data the cost of the building modifications to put these big devices, MRI and PET, into existing facilities. But sometimes this just doesn't work. You have to build something new, and we did not know what that would take. Um, Non-financial obstacles, like you can't 3D print dementia specialists, right? You need to hire them, train them, and that takes a lot longer than just kind of investing. Um, on the flip side, we are having changes in technology like blood tests, digital cognitive tests that could actually ease the burden on the delivery system. So some of the numbers might come down. Um, but keep in mind, these things are an area of active research. That doesn't mean that we have them and have them approved and covered by NHS any day soon. So for the time being, that pessimistic picture actually holds. Okay, so overall, long-standing underinvestment in the NHS would likely lead to very long wait times for um, diagnosis to receive a disease-modifying treatment in England up to 10 years, I mean, seriously. Um, and that is really, really counter to the NHS guarantee to um, get a specialist diagnosis and access to treatment within 18 weeks of referral. So there's a really, really big gap between aspiration and reality. So there does need to be a targeted investment um, to actually reach even the average of G7. And that would actually make a big difference because the baseline situation is so poor. Yes, technology will help. Clearly, we are getting better at diagnosing at scale. But again, this is not something that we will have right away. And we have to keep in mind that the cost of inaction is also large, right? There is the bankable cost of putting people into care homes, but there's also, as the previous speaker has explained, the burden often unmeasured on caregivers. So it's not just an expenditure for the government, there's also a real benefit of doing so. And for those of you taking pictures, um, this paper will be out really soon, so you can get all these graphs and numbers um, downloaded at much better quality. So, thank you very much. Happy to take questions. So, thank you so much for that really interesting presentation. I think the especially when it comes down to, you know, we talk about the need for, you know, timely diagnosis and to get, you know, an accurate diagnosis. And I think you've shown really clearly there that, uh, especially if in the case of England, that that's not at the level and that the resource has not, needs to be put in to make that a possibility, um, both through, you know, MRI scanning, but also through uh, investment in the NHS. Does anyone have any questions uh, for Soren? Hi, thanks so much for this presentation. I have a question about the wait time uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so does this reflect, you said it's all on published data and of course there are a lot of unknowns and you needed to use expert opinion, but is this currently reflecting uh, the current situation or is this in the case that these biomarker um, based drugs come available and then there needs to be testing for them to get access right. to the drugs? It's the latter, because right now, very few people with especially early stage dementia and or Alzheimer's disease are even sort of picked up or let alone diagnosed. Paradoxically, the later stages are of course diagnosed because the symptoms become hard to ignore. And at the same time, interestingly, a lot more diagnostics is done in moderate and severe dementia, even though the therapeutic consequences of knowing the exact etiology are quite limited. So it's kind of the other way around as it should be, and we will have to flip to be um, much more, much faster in early stage and early stage accurate diagnosis. Thanks for this presentation. It's a real worrying uh, figures that you presented, and you talked about the 
context of infrastructure that we need once there are drugs, uh, the MRI, the PET scans and so on, and that's a blind spot in many countries. Media and policy makers focus on the drugs themselves, but we're hearing like they're gonna cost like 25,000 uh, euros per year per person. You did not take into account those costs? No. no and that, why not? How would that change the picture? It doesn't change the picture. It's just without that investment, you don't even have to worry about the cost of the drug because they are not even getting on treatment. Um, I mean, I don't think the drug will, drugs will be as expensive in the US, in Europe. They never are for some reason. Um, but they will be expensive. And not necessarily because the price per patient is that high, because if you look at other things like oncology or immunology, the price per person is actually much higher than what you see for the um, current price of Selicanumab with 25,000. I mean, Umira, which is an anti-inflammatory drug that should have been off patent um, for a couple of years already, is about three times that. And that's kind of for autoimmune disorders. Um, the problem is the number of people, so it's the budget impact and the fact that we have an extremely prevalent condition in the elderly um, that makes policy makers worry. It's not the cost of one person, it's the, the number of persons. But it's sort of a difficult question to say, well, if you have a common disease, we don't treat it because it could get expensive when we have sort of no inhibitions to spend hundreds of thousands for cancer cases, which individually are not that expensive, but as a group are also very expensive. But that's, that's just me, so. Okay, uh, last question. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Mecke. My name is Sophie Lou Axelson from Stockholm, Sweden. I was wondering if you can please elaborate a little bit more on the early detection software or technology that you would like to see in place. Um, I'd like to share one case study of a memory clinic in Stockholm, Sweden. They've had a 150 person queue that was blocking up the system. They initiated one software and they cleared it up in two weeks. Karolinska Institute, it has 280 people waiting for, pe for some kind of action and they've extrapolated a model that says like they're not going to be able to address it or clear up that queue until 2027 if nothing changes. Mm -hmm. So I would like to have your perspective as to what you would like to see as ideal, safe, scalable, implementable early detection. What is in your, you know, wizard of all, what would you think we should be having <laughs> so that it's uh, something that we can all take with us? Thank you. Of course, it's a very good question. So for starters, um, we need relatively robust, easy, scalable and cheap screening tools at the primary care level because right now um, we've just published a paper, the detection rates in the US and probably also in other countries of early stage disease are dismal. Right? So we don't even have the problem of wait times because they never get there. So we need tools that are more accurate than the common tools like Mini Mental or Mocha but don't require like 15 minutes to sit down and score. Like digital cognitive assessments that are reasonably precise um, to avoid what's also a problem with the many mental, a relatively large number of false positives. At the specificity of these tests is only about 75% and change. And that doesn't sound too terrible, but that means 25% of the 50 plus 65 plus whatever you have your, your cut is population will be false positive and sent to a neurologist. And that basically kills the system because 25% of the full population, that's just a lot of people that actually don't have a cognitive problem and still get sent forward. So if we can bring down that number, we are in a much better shape. Also, if we um, get blood tests, obviously, for the Alzheimer's pathology, um, we can be a lot more targeted. We've done a paper a few years ago that um, the wait, list, wait lists almost disappear if you... Um, if you is that my signal? <laughs> uh, 
uh, if you introduce a blood test and triage based on a cognitive and a blood test. Such hard triage is probably not going to happen, but it can tell us that if you have a reasonably accurate blood test that you can say, well, I mean, we have no evidence of cognitive impairment, early stage, no positive blood test, so this could be a disease-modifying treatment candidate. That person gets into a fast lane as opposed to somebody else. It's also the flow, because right now people are sent to a neurologist with very little information. Right? They come with subjective memory complaints, stuff, and then the neurologist has to start from scratch. Okay, history, basic labs, MRI scan, talking to family, and that all can be done before somebody comes into the neurologist so that he gets, like or she, a nice dossier and can see, what, okay, no stroke, no vitamin deficiencies, um, pretty fast progression, early onset, looks like Alzheimer's, even a blood test, so let's get that PET scan or lumbar puncture quickly because that person has a limited window to get treated with, with a drug that can actually change his or her life. Easy said. Hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Soren. Can we have another round of applause for a really excellent presentation and the questions? Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Bethany Anthony, who's going to uh, present on the topic of an online pre-death grief and loss programme for carers of people living with a rare dementia, a micro-costing analysis of the road west travelled. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bethany Anthony. I'm a research officer um, at the Centre for Health, Economics and Medicines Evaluation at Bangor University. And today I'm going to talk to you about a study I've had the pleasure of working on with colleagues at the Rare Dementia Support Research Team. So uh, this talks on the micro-costing analysis of the road less travelled, which is an online pre-death grief and loss programme for carers of people living with a rare dementia. Um, so this works part of the Rare Dementia Support Impact Project, which is jointly funded by the Economic and Social Research Council and the National Institute for Health and Care Research. I'd also like to acknowledge the National Brain Appeal, who generously supports Rare Dementia Support. And I'd also like to, um, of course, thank all of the participants who took part in the study. So first of all, um, just some background information really um, to give some perspective of what we're doing and to begin with some prevalent statistics. So there are 885,000 people living with dementia in the UK and of these it's estimated that between 5 and 15% are living with a rare dementia. In 2019, the total cost of dementia care in the UK was £34.7 billion and this is expected to rise to £94.1 billion by 2040. So in 2019, unpaid care accounted for 40% of the total cost to dementia care. So carers make up a really significant financial contribution. So unfortunately, we know there's often um, negative impacts on health and wellbeing associated with caring roles. Consequently, family and friend caregivers of people living with dementia are often referred to as the invisible second patient, as their roles are known to increase the risk of psychological distress and adverse health outcomes. And caregivers often experience grief and loss before bereavement actually occurs, as they cope with changes to their relationship and changes to their own identity. And pre-death grief can impact individuals for many years. And it's a particularly complex process for those caring for someone with a rare dementia, which frequently occurred before the age of 65. So now moving on to our study aim. So the purpose of the study was to assess the delivery costs of the road less traveled, which is an online pre-death grief and loss program for carers of people living with a rare dementia. So this programme is part of the RDS service, led by the Dementia Research Centre at University College London, and they support a membership of nearly 5,000 individuals with, working with, or living alongside a rare dementia. So now moving on to some information about the programme itself, so the road less travelled. 
So the programme was designed with and for rare dementia care carers, tailored to supporting those facing um, anticipatory grief and ambiguous loss in the present by virtue of caring for a loved one with a rare dementia. So the programme was specifically developed to allow carers to explore their feelings of pre-death grief and loss, to share their experiences with others and to make a plan for the future. So why consider costs? Why are they important? So cost information is important to aid in decision making around what interventions are good value for money. Resources are finite and therefore decisions about what we invest in are necessary. And this is particularly important when we consider that there's an opportunity cost of investing in one thing over another. Gathering information about costs can help us forecast budgets over time and this can help to ensure that there's funds available to, en to, to enable services to continue. And ultimately, when we talk about costs, we're talking about allocating resources in their best possible use. And this is, of course, fundamental to ensure that people living with dementia and their carers are receiving the best possible services. So moving on to the study methods. So from a provider perspective, we conducted a bottom-up micro-costing analysis to explore the delivery costs of the road less travelled, including staff time and material costs. So the programme was delivered online by two experienced facilitators with professional and personal experiences of rare dementia. And the programme was delivered to small groups of participant carers located in different regions across the UK. So health economics data was collected in cost diaries completed by the facilitators and facilitator time was costed by applying an hourly rate with on costs using salary information provided by the study primary investigator. So in this analysis, uh, costs were presented in British pound sterling for the cost year 2022. So our base case analysis explored um, the upfront costs of delivering three waves of the, pro of the programme to 20 carer participants in total in an online format. So um, two of the waves, waves one and three, consisted of six two-hour sessions and the third wave, which was wave two, consisted of seven two-hour sessions. So there were 20 participants in total nine in wave one, four in wave two, and seven in wave three. Uh, we also conducted sensitivity analysis to explore the potential costs of face-to-face -face delivery. Um, and we did this by using cost estimates provided by the RDS study team to include things like value hire and catering costs. Uh, we also conducted a separate budget impact analysis exercise to explore the potential costs of rollout of the programme across the whole of the UK. And we used um, published prevalence statistics and the findings from our base case analysis for this. So now moving on to our results from our base case analysis. Um, so this, uh, this table shows the total time accumulated by the two facilitators, the subsequent costs and the material costs. So the total cost of delivering the grief and loss programme was £9,848 and this equates to £492 per carer participant. And as you can see from the table, uh, the largest driver of costs were, you know, time spent planning the sessions followed by time spent delivering the sessions. So moving on to our sensitivity analysis findings. So the estimated total costs for face-to-face -face delivery of the programme was £14,673. And this was based on the total costs accrued in our base case analysis and additional venue hire and catering costs. So this equates to £734 per participant. Now for our budget impact analysis. So um, a report commissioned by the Alzheimer's Society reported that the number of people with dementia in the UK is estimated at 885,000. It's also estimated that between 5 and 15% of people with dementia have a rare type of dementia. So this equates to between 44,250 
and 132,750 people potentially with a rare dementia in the UK. <clears throat> Um, so using the cost per carer participant calculated in our base case analysis um, and these prevalence statistics, the total cost of rollout of the programme to one carer for every person with a rare dementia in the UK would be between £21.77 million and £65.3 million. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so also, just to add here that given that estimates of rare dementia are scarce, um, it's reasonable to assume that only a small proportion of those with the rare dementia will ever receive the diagnosis that they deserve. So it may be more appropriate to consider the lower end of the 5 to 15% prevalence estimate range when taking into account these projected costs. Okay, so just to sum it all up now. So online programmes may have the potential to reduce costs and due to the rarity of this condition, it may be less cost efficient and infeasible to populate small groups of carers of people with rare dementias to deliver these types of programmes face to face. So because the road less travelled was delivered online, it meant it was accessible to participants from a large geographical area. Um, also, in future, it'd be helpful to explore additional costs, such as costs of scaling up um, training of facilitators to deliver the programme at this level. Um, it's also um, worth noting that the costs of programmes, you know, may not remain stable over time. And it must be noted that the costs that I've presented here reflect um, a pilot stage of delivery, whether the programme continues to develop. Um, in addition, the very high costs associated with facilitator planning activities reported here may reflect initial setup costs during this pilot stage um, and therefore may be expected to decrease over time and maybe transition into to training costs. And for this analysis, we adopted a narrow provider perspective to explore de delivery costs alone. However, given the human cost of dementia and the cost to health and social care, future research may wish to adopt a wider societal perspective to consider indirect costs, such as productivity losses for the participant's time, attending the programme, and then any other potential costs, such as travel and respite costs. And these are all particularly important, you know, when we consider there's an opportunity cost of delivering these types of programmes. So to our knowledge, this is the first um, costing analysis of a pre-death grief and loss programme for carers of people living with rare dementia. And these initial assessments of costs provide a useful base case for future costing analyses and also full economic evaluations, which is currently on, on, on its way that we're working on right now. So full economic evaluations that assess both the cost and benefits to society from supporting people with rare dementias and their carers. So yeah, that's, that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much, Kito Salsinki. Happy to take any uh, questions. Thank you so much for your presentation, Bethany. I think that was really interesting. I've not, to my knowledge, I've not seen a, a programme quite like that for persons with their dementia and for the carers um, in that sort of stage of the, their journey. So it's really interesting to see that and see the costs. Um, are there any questions from the audience? We have time for one question, maybe. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, I suppose comparing this to maybe other online programs that you might consider for dementia, I don't know, advanced care planning, maybe not for the rare dementia group. Maybe, do you have a feel for how this might compare or is there anything in particular for rare dementias that increases the costs or is it, is it like to be quite similar for other online programs? Um, that's a really, really good question actually and it's not something I've considered, but particularly because I haven't really found any similar online programs for you know, rare dementia, really, um, nothing published anyway. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of the costs, it's, you know, you can assume it's quite a reasonable cost, really, considering it's such a, 
you know, specific programme tailored for people, carers of people with rare dementia. And when you can compare, you know, costs of maybe perhaps an hour of CBT, I don't know what that is, about £50 per session. I think this is, you know, good value for many, I'd say. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can we have another round of applause for Bethany's presentation? Thank you. Thanks so much. So, uh, to move on to our next presenter, I'd like to invite Hannah Maria uh, Reutel from Finland to present um, on the incidence and prevalence of dementia diagnosis in Finland uh, in 2016 to 2021. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Chiara Brück. I'm from the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. And I'm going to present uh, my study on whether uh, case managers could potentially curb the financial burden of dementia in the future. So a bit about case management uh, in general, because um, not everybody might be familiar with this concept. So case managers in general are healthcare professionals who can support, guide, and coordinate care for patients and caregivers, um, also for other conditions um, than dementia. Um, the literature has... Um, proposed that they have the potential to um, first delay institutionalization of people with dementia, um, to improve the quality of life for people with dementia and their caregivers as well, um, and also um, to have the potential to lower costs due to the optimization of care, such that people get the right care at the right moment and also don't have, um, for example, double um, um, go to double care uh, professionals. Um, however, these uh, benefits that have been proposed, um, the findings for these proposed um, ben uh, benefits are quite mixed in the literature. So some, pe some studies find uh, some benefits, others find that the, the case managers do not influence uh, any of these three uh, dimensions. Um, however, a Dutch um, study, the COMPAS study, recently found um, definitely lower costs uh, for case management and a bit more about the COMPASS study here. Um, so the study aim was to compare uh, the, the total costs of case, two prominent case management um, types in the Netherlands against no access to case management. And these two types were the uh, intensive case management and the linkage model. And the study was conducted from a societal perspective, so they included informal care costs uh, of the um, informal carers. Um, it was a two-year prospective observational controlled uh, cohort study, and the sample included 521 um, informal caregivers and community dwelling persons with dementia. Here, a brief overview of the results of the COMPASS study. So they found no differences in the quality of life of both the um, people with dementia and their caregivers, and this was measured with the generic uh, EQ5D um, measurement. Um, but they did find lower costs uh, for both of these case management types uh, com compared to the control group. So the control group had co total costs over these two years of around 108,000 uh, euros. And then the linkage model um, type reduced that to uh, around 84,000 and then the intensive case management even to uh, 69,000. And in my presentation going forward, I will show um, estimates based on the linkage model. So in this study, we took the more conservative um, type of case management um, costs. So in this study, we then wanted to investigate the effect of case managers on the future burden of dementia on a population level using the cost estimates of the COMPASS study. And we did that by analyzing analyzing two different parts, um, which was one, increasing the prevalence of case managers in the population, and then also looking into the effectiveness of case management uh, in terms of a nursing home postponement, which the COMPASS study did not find, but the literature really suggests that that is a, a huge potential of case managers. Uh, for the study, we used the microsimulation model MISCAN dementia. Um, so a microsimulation model um, is that you simulate individuals one at a time, and it makes it possible that new events of an individu individual can depend on past events. Um, it's also a population-based model, so that means we simulated a large number of individuals, and we followed them throughout their entire lifetime. Um, and um, the data that this part of the model was based on is from St Statistics Netherlands, so it represents the Dutch population um, in ten different or eight different birth cohorts from 1910 to 1980. 
Uh, and here you can see the natural history structure of our model. So everybody starts in the cognitively normal phase, and then they may develop an MCI, which can then progress to mild, moderate, and severe dementia. Um, and they can transition within the model from home to a nursing home. And at any point in time during the model, they can also die of other causes than dementia. And this um, part of the model was informed by data from the Rotterdam study, which is a large population-based cohort study conducted in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. So let's move to the analysis. Um, so as I said, we wanted to increase the prevalence of case managers, but also look at the effectiveness in terms of uh, nursing home postponement. I'm going to explain um, that part a little bit further, how we implemented that. So imagine this is the progression of uh, an individual in our model uh, with dementia without a case manager. So they progress through mild, moderate, and severe dementia. And first they um, start out living at home, and then they tra transition to a nursing home um, during the mild dementia stage. Now imagine they got a case manager, and this would hypothetically, um, the nursing home postponement was uh, postponed by two, or nursing home admission was postponed by two years. And here, one of our assumptions um, is uh, displayed, which is that the case manager does not influence the disease progression of dementia. They only influence the nursing home admission um, in our model. And this can also, in our model, be three years or four years. Um, but here, another assumption um, is shown, which is that case management postpones only nursing home admission until severe dementia. And we made this assumption because um, from the data that we have um, collected or we have used, um, the severe dementia stage at home becomes so uh, expensive in terms of informal caregiving that actually nursing homes then become um, cheaper. So even when case managers could postpone uh, nursing home admission into the severe dementia stage from a financial point of view, um, that is then also not um, beneficial and for the case care, informal carers and case managers, case managers, it also becomes a huge burden in the final stage of um, the disease. So here um, for the analysis, this was our base case. So um, we assumed a 30% uh, prevalence of case managers based on the uh, Dutch case management research done in the Netherlands. Um, the nursing home postponement, as I said, there's a lot of heterogeneous findings in the literature, but the studies that did look at uh, institutionalization and found an effect clustered around six uh, months, so we took that as the base case, and the costs we took from the COMPASS study, which I explained earlier. And this is the variation we looked at, so we varied the prevalence between 30 and 100 percent, and the nursing home postponement, since that was very... Um, uh, unclear from the literature, we varied that from zero, percent, uh, from zero months to five years. And for costs, we also looked at the 95% confidence interval of the COMPASS study. And then we calculated the total costs um, associated with dementia care from a societal perspective from 2020 to 2050 for the Dutch population. And here you can see the base case. So you can see total costs associated with dementia um, in millions on the y-axis, and then calendar years from 2020 to 2050 on the x-axis. And um, as you can see from this graph, the total costs um, doubled basically between 2020 and 2050 from 13 million to um, 26 million. Now, if we look at uh, pre the prevalence analysis, now we kept the six months nursing home postponement uh, fixed and varied the prevalence from, zero, from 30% to 100%. And that resulted in uh, a 2050, a 16.5 difference in total costs due to dementia. If we look at the nursing home postponement, so now we have the 30% uh, prevalence fixed, but we varied the nursing home postponement between zero months and five years. We see that that actually did not influence the costs all that much. Actually, it was a difference of less than 1% for most of these um, analyses. And, oh, sorry. And we think that is because there's this competition between disease progression and nursing home admission. So the disease progression is not stopped by a case manager. So um, um, yeah, at the to severe dementia stage in our model, people then progress to a nursing home um, if they had progressed anyways to a nursing home. Um, so there is not that much cost saving, it seems, from our model projections. And here are the uh, cost assumptions, so the 95 confidence interval of the um, COMPASS study, 
and that varied our estimates around 2.5% plus or minus. So, um, yeah, what did we find? We found that uh, case manager prevalence had the biggest impact on total costs, and a nursing home postponement had a limited impact, um, and we think that is mostly because of the competition with disease progression. Um, so this study uh, showed the potential of what could happen if, for example, the compass study costs reflect actual reality, but there's a lot of uncertainty about the costs and as well as uh, the effectiveness of case managers, so there's a lot of unknowns, and this is by no means the reality as it is, but a potential of what could happen. Um, also, this study reflects the Dutch situation and healthcare systems can have a huge impact on uh, effectiveness but also costs of case managers because every country deals differently with um, people with dementia and the healthcare system in general. Also, there are different types of case managers. What I mentioned before, we took the estimates from the linkage model, but there are even um, yeah, different, different types that result in different costs and different effectiveness. Uh, and this study shows only the, the effect of the costs and institutionalization, um, but we did not incorporate quality of life effects because they were so rare um, in the literature that we could not find any good estimates to base an, an analysis on. Uh, here's some take home messages. So there's a lot of uncertainty around the effectiveness and cost of case managers. Um, as I said, this shows the potential um, to lower societal costs by up to 16.5% um, if we, we use the cost estimates of the COMPASS study. Um, we should, based on this analysis, we think we should um, um, examine case manager as a potential solution to the rising cost of dementia in the future given the rise in number of people with dementia we can expect in the future. Um, and further analysis should also be uh, taken into the timing of case managers, like when would be the optimal time to um, give a person with dementia a case manager to help them in their journey. Um, and implementation studies could possibly shed light on this uh, timing issue. Um, and a special thanks to our collaborators from the Rotterdam study and the epidemiology department of, the, uh, of Erasmus Medical Center, Professor Arkham Ikram and Dr. Frank Wolters, as well as Dr. Ron Handels from the Alzheimer Centrum Limburg in Maastricht, uh, the Netherlands. And thank you very much. Thank you so much for that really interesting presentation. Um, I think case management is something that I've heard come up over the past couple of days in uh, meeting with the um, European Dementia Carers Working Group and the European Working Group of People with Dementia. It's very, um, you know, it's quite a, a pertinent topic and case management is something they want to, to really see. So I think to have a study like this is incredibly helpful and really useful. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions just before we finish. So. Kolominski Rabas, I'm a neurologist and health economist from Germany. Thank you very much for your very impressive presentation. Could you shortly comment on the linkage model, please? Yeah, so the two different types. So the intensive case management, as far as I understood, so I was not involved in a COMPASS study, but what I know of these types. Um, the linkage model is basically um, a case manager that reaches out to different um, healthcare providers and coordinates the care through, through yeah, reaching out and then getting other care, um, yeah, care um, for the dementia per person with dementia. Whereas the intensive case management, they really have uh, provide the, all the care themselves. So there's a case manager that has like in-house uh, diagnosis, in-house um, care. So the linkage model is more uh, linking different case, uh, different care. Thank you. And one more question. Uh, okay, two more questions. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ulrike and I'm from Sweden and uh, I'm uh, curious, the, the increase of uh, cost, 16%, where, where does the increase come from? Is it because the person has fewer emergency visits or is it because there is a better organization of healthcare uh, visits? Yeah, so what the COMPASS study found, it was uh, a decrease in yeah, emergency uh, visits and um, uh, hospital admission, but also the daily, um, yeah, daily care costs of going to different, um, different care institutions. Um, yeah, well, for example, the informal caregiver had to work. So this, this management of these types of uh, care is uh, better organized. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Oops. In 
that case then, um, also thank you again to Jared for your really excellent presentation. Um, I'm going to bring the session to a close. I'm going to say thank you again to all of our speakers for really interesting presentations, both for looking at individual carers, looking at services, doing a sort of macro analysis. I think that we've had a real insight into different levels of the economics of uh, dementia here today. So thank you to our speakers again. <laughs> round of applause. Thank you all for coming to the session and for taking part for your questions. Thank you to the people who joined us online. There is now a 15-minute break before the next session starts at 12. Thank you.